Welcome back to Dinner with Friends and happy Valentine's, or should I say Galentine's? We are throwing a Galentine's Day party. It is a Galentine's Day pasta party. Woo! Get excited. I am extremely ill prepared for today's cooking session. I'm just gonna come out and say it. Last go around, I had a whole sheet of all the dishes I was making and the ingredients and the instructions. And this time around, it's all up here. I, I didn't write down anything. I'm going off script. I'm extremely disorganized. I feel like I'm back in high school and I showed up for a test that I forgot to study for. Um, so if this episode feels a bit frazzled, that's because I'm frazzled. So apologies in advance. You may or may not have noticed I'm in a new apartment. It looks exactly the same, yes. Since we last spoke, I moved um, and that is a big reason why I am so frazzled because it's just moving is a shit show. I don't know how else to say it. It's brought me to my breaking point. Yesterday I had a full mental breakdown, crying in the shower. Stress, 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 stress. Mental breakdown. That was me yesterday, um, but I went for a walk. I got a special little drink. I called my mom and now we're back. I've pulled myself out of the mental breakdown to be here today to show you how to throw a Galentine's Day pasta party. And that's real. I can't sit here and pretend like everything's hunky-dory over here because yesterday I almost called it quits. I'm moving to the countryside. I'm not cut out for this life. Turns out I was just hungry and whatever. <laughs> Anywho, let's get started. Galentine's Day pasta party. My plan was to make two pastas, a baked pasta and then a pesto pasta because my friends love a pesto pasta. It's kind of like our thing. Every time we go on vacation together and I'm cooking dinner for everyone, there is going to be a bowl of pesto pasta on the dinner table. So that was a non-negotiable. And then for the baked pasta, I put up on my Instagram story, baked ziti or baked gnocchi, because I wanted to see what the audience wanted to see. I was feeling very passionately about a baked gnocchi, because like, I don't know, sometimes you just like get a craving for gnocchi and nothing will satisfy that other than a plate of gnocchi, like the pillowy soft, oh my God. Anyways, baked ziti one, but like by a hair. And so I had 10,000 people saying that they wanted baked ziti, but then I had 8,000 people saying that they wanted baked gnocchi. And I, I just didn't want to disappoint anyone. So I compromised and I'm doing both. <laughs> the party's tomorrow, sorry. Oh my God, I'm like all over the place. Today is Friday, the party is tomorrow. It's a lunch party, Galentine's Day lunch. So everyone's coming over at one o'clock. So I have to do a lot of the work today because I don't wanna be like running around with my head cut off tomorrow. Oh my God. I already did all the grocery shopping. I didn't take you guys with me because again, I was feeling frazzled, um, but we're stocked with groceries. I sat down to film twice this morning and realized that I forgot stuff and then had to go back out to the grocery store twice. <laughs> We're getting a late start today. Oh wait, is the clock doing weird things? Should I tape the clock? We're getting a late start today, but maybe we'll catch the sunset together and that would be extremely romantic for the occasion. The menu for the Galentine's Day pasta party. Pesto pasta, baked ziti, baked gnocchi, salad, and a pasto grazing board. For dessert, I have a cake. I bought, I didn't buy the cake. Someone sent me the cake. It's a Martha Stewart cake. And when they reached out, they were like, hey, do you want us to send you Martha Stewart's Valentine's Day cake? I was like, oh my God, perfect, please send it to me. So I'm not making dessert because we saw how that went last time. What the Not fun. And I'm just like, I'm running on empty right now. So I'm doing us all a favor and I'm not doing dessert. Now the to-do list today, we're gonna start by making the pesto, making the red sauce for the ziti, making the red sauce for the gnocchi, we'll get into the specifics, and making the salad dressing. And then maybe like cute prep, prepping the antipasto, like cubing cheese and slicing bread. When I was catering, I discovered that the biggest favor I can do for myself is to pre-slice the cheese for the charcuterie board or antipasto board in this case, and like pre-slice the bread. If you're slicing a loaf of bread, like a bowl of sourdough, do it, in advance because it's gonna create so much mess on your kitchen counters <laughs> that like doing that right before people come over it's so unnecessarily stressful there's just like crumbs everywhere it's like a whole thing that's all we're doing today 
and that was the air conditioning. That feels achievable. It's gonna be fine, everything's gonna be fine. It's just pasta. It's not about the pasta! We need more cosmopolitans! Pumptini! Okay, I need to stop. Can you see me? Okay, I fully just bumped my head on the countertop, bending over to pick something up off the floor. So if I start developing a big red welt on my forehead throughout this program, that's why. <laughs> we're off to a fantastic start. Like I said, we're gonna start by grating the cheese. This cheese is gonna be going into the pesto and into the pasta sauce. When it comes to grating cheese to be sprinkled on top of pasta, I like to freshly grate it on top of the pasta because it creates like a cloud. But since we're just emulsifying this cheese into pasta sauce, it doesn't matter if it's like light, fluffy, airy, freshly microplaned parm. It can be food processor, food processor parm, if that makes sense. Always save your Parmesan rinds. Throw it in a pot with a bunch of water and make a Parmesan stock. It'll blow your mind. Throw that into a soup instead of a vegetable stock or a chicken stock. Literally so crazy. And always buy the block. It's so much cheaper per pound to buy a block of parm than to buy grated parm. Like you're doing yourself a disservice and the quality, like this is from Italy. The quality, unmatched. Now, Parmesan cheese is made from cow's milk. Pecorino cheese, we'll get to, is like Parmesan's uh, little sister in that Pecorino kind of sits in the shadow of parm, but it deserves respect. It's made of sheep's milk, so it's a bit sharper and a bit tangier. Parm is like salty, creamy, sweet, a little nutty. Pecorino is like sharp and super salty and a little tangy. I don't know, I love Pecorino. Okay, parm in. Pulse, oh, just kidding. Pulse. Fab. Freshly grated parm. It's time for the pecorino. Now when I make homemade pesto, I like to use a blend of parm and pecorino, but honestly, it really doesn't matter which one you use. In my opinion, as long as you're making fresh pesto, it's gonna be better than the store-bought. Oh, the, another bonus of pecorino is it's typically more affordable than parm. Like, it's less expensive by the pound. Okay. Pecorino is in, where did I put the top? Oh, it's right there. You wanna get the cheese as fine as possible so that it emulsifies or it melts more evenly and it doesn't get all clumpy. Pecorino is done. Now we're gonna prep the rest of the ingredients for the homemade pesto. Woo! Okay, pesto time. I like to do a blend of basil and parsley because I think parsley adds a freshness and a grassiness to it that you don't really get from the basil. But if you'd like to do all basil, go for it. If you'd like to do all parsley, go for it. I actually started adding parsley to my pesto when I was fresh out of college, extremely broke. Fresh basil is probably like four times as expensive as fresh parsley. So I started supplementing half of my basil with parsley because it was cheaper and it would save me like four bucks. The Rifty Queen. But yeah, if you're falling on a budge, parsley pesto is the way to go. Homemade pesto is one of the first things I learned how to cook. My family is not Italian at all whatsoever, but all of my mom's friends are Italian. And her one friend would make a big batch of homemade pesto and give out little containers of it to everyone. And so when my mom would bring home this pesto, my body would levitate, my eyes would roll through the back of my head. It was just like the most delicious, amazing thing ever. And I was like, mom, we gotta make this shit. Like we can't be waiting on the next batch to drop. We have to be resourceful. 
So my mom got the pesto recipe from her friend and we made it together. And now whenever I smell fresh basil, I think of my mommy. So sweet. And now my mom like has this monstrous basil plant in our backyard that pops off every summer. And we're just like in basil heaven. We are basil rich all summer. Whipping up pesto like every week. It's just a staple in our house. Okay, we have our herbs. I would say the proportions of this are about 75% basil, 25% parsley. No, I don't measure. Like measuring herbs in terms of cups just like feels like a waste of time to me because we're all gonna measure that differently. I don't know, but I would say this is about five or six cups. A big bowl's worth, this much. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to blanch and shock our herbs. This will keep them super bright green and prevent them from oxidizing and turning brown once we make the pesto. This step is optional. If this step is what's preventing you from making homemade pesto, skip it. You just might have, oh my God. You just might have some brown pesto. Um, so yeah, we're gonna blanch and shock these, which just means to drop them in boiling water and then transfer them into a bowl of ice water. Um, and I'm gonna come grab you and we're gonna hit the stove. Boiling water, ice water, time to blanch. Now we're gonna have these in the boiling water for about 30 seconds. Long enough for the herbs to turn bright green, but not so long that we're like cooking them. I'm going to toss them until I can feel that they've cooled down all the way and then I'm immediately going to strain them and squeeze out the extra water. Okay, now we need to toast our pine nuts for the pesto. If you've never experienced the pure bliss of a toasted pine nut, let me put you on. Pine nuts are delicious. However, they can be very expensive. I got a pretty big bag of these from Whole Foods for like six bucks, um, but they tend to be definitely on the pricier side. When I would make pesto, when I was really broke, I would substitute the pine nuts for walnuts or whatever nut was on sale at the grocery store that week. Putting nuts in a pesto creates a creaminess and a nuttiness to the pesto, similar to how you would think like pureed cashews make cashew milk and like that milk is creamy, but it's just like nuts. The nuts add a ton of creaminess and lots of flavor to the pesto. I used to skip this. I used to think like, pesto doesn't need pine nuts, but no, it does. The pine nuts are arguably the best part. So we're gonna toast them up. Now we definitely don't wanna burn our pine nuts. So we're gonna wanna stand by the stove while we're toasting them. We don't wanna walk away. We're gonna have our stove on medium low heat and we're just gonna toss these every few seconds until they start to turn golden brown and nutty. And then we're gonna kill the heat because they're gonna continue to brown after the heat is turned off. And we're gonna transfer them into a little container. I'm guessing this is gonna take like four minutes. When they start toasting, you're gonna be able to hear it. Listen. You hear that? That's the oils. We're opening up the oils. You wanna keep the party moving because you might have some parts of your pan that are hotter than others and also some pine nuts may not be making full contact with the pan. Okay, it's time to make our pesto. We're making the pesto in a food processor. Traditionally, it's made in a mortar and pestle. I don't have time for that. You could also make it in a blender. So for our pesto, we need our toasted pine nuts, about a quarter cup. I'll do a little more. Before I add my herbs, I am going to pulse the pine nuts into as fine of a grind as possible so that we don't overwork the herbs in the food processor trying to grind down these pine nuts. Technically, you're conducting heat in the food processor as you're blending and the heat can brown your herbs past the point of no return. You almost want to form like peanut butter. You guys, the smell of these pine nuts is intoxicating. Okay, our pine nuts are ground super fine. Now we're going to add our herbs and some of our oil. 
squeezing out more of that water. Look how much that the, the herbs really, <laughs> our herbs really shrunk down when we blanched them. Okay, so traditionally in Italy, pesto is made with olive oil and just olive oil. A lot of recipes here in the States will call for vegetable oil, a more neutral oil, if you will. That is because vegetable oil has virtually no flavor to it. And so by using vegetable oil instead of olive oil, you get a more basil forward flavor from your pesto. However, I happen to be in the possession of copious amounts of olive oil and very delicious olive oil at that. So I'm going to be doing 100% olive oil in my pesto. My recipes also call for 100% olive oil just because the idea of putting vegetable oil in a pesto like makes my skin crawl a little bit and I can't exactly tell you why. Um, this feels better to me. However, if you again are on a budget making homemade pesto, use vegetable oil instead of olive oil. It's typically less expensive than olive oil. Now, in total, I'm gonna use a cup of olive oil, but I'm gonna just add some in here now to get it started and then gradually add more as we blitz. Shout out Partana olive oil. It's delicious. It's from Sicily. Just a splash to get her started. And now we're gonna drizzle. Scrape the sides. Ooh, she's looking so creamy from that pine nut butter. It looks so delicious and buttery. And creamy from the pine nuts. Now we are going to add cheese. The cheese is very salty. We don't want to over salt this mixture. And then by the time we add this, this is too salty. So I'm just going to add a pinch of salt. Let's taste it. Wow, yum. Oh my God, I forgot the garlic. Holy guacamole, I almost made pesto without garlic. I was supposed to add the garlic <laughs> with the pine nuts. I knew I was missing something. Oh my gosh, please hold. So since I don't wanna blitz this into oblivion, I'm gonna finally grate some garlic and then just add it in. Oh my goodness, thank God I realized. Microplane, literally one of my favorite kitchen tools ever. Two to three cloves of garlic. Do you ever have that feeling where you like leave the house and you're like, I'm totally forgetting something, but I've already stood here for five minutes trying to figure out what it was. So I like need to leave and like hope for the best. And then when you're halfway to your destination, you realize what it is. That's how I felt about this. I was like, there's totally something missing, but I genuinely have no idea what it is. It was the garlic. I'm so sorry, Garly. Now it's a mistake that I've made in the past. Before I learned the value of restraint in cooking, I used to overwhelm my pesto, my homemade pesto with so much garlic. If a recipe called for two cloves of garlic, I would add four, I would add five, sometimes six. And then I'd be like, oh my God, why does my pesto taste like Girl, because it's straight up raw garlic. So trust me when I say two to three cloves is plenty. You can always add more, but you can never take away. So I'm gonna do two and a half. And since I microplaned it, it's already super fine and I can just add it at this stage and we'll be fine. Everything's fine, it's fine. Garlic is now incorporated. If you're tasting food, but you don't wanna use a ton of tasting spoons, use one spoon to scoop and then just like drip it onto your tasting spoon. Mm. Honestly, I'm gonna add the rest of this clove. So good though. Now I'm going to do a 50-50 pecorino to parm. I'm gonna do a quarter cup of pecorino and a quarter cup of parm. Pesto is really just 25% pine nuts, 25% cheese, 50% herbs, all suspended in delicious yummy olive oil with a hint of garlic. It's not that complicated. If you can make a smoothie, you can make pesto. Pulse. Can you believe? Delicious homemade pesto.
okay, our pesto is done. I'm gonna put this little guy in the freezer and save him for a rainy day. Um, put this one in the fridge and then I'm gonna clean my kitchen, reset everything, and then we'll be back to make the red sauce for the ziti and the red sauce for the gnocchi. So exciting. Okay, the sun is starting to come in, so we're gonna... Whew. Now before we move on to our next dish, we're gonna have a little vocabulary lesson. What is baked ziti? Baked ziti to me is a tubular pasta suspended in a red sauce with cheese baked in the oven. Sometimes with meat, sometimes without meat. Now, I really don't like baked zitis that are heavy on the ricotta, and I really don't like baked zitis that fully incorporate the ricotta into the red sauce, and you get this like weird pink like grainy ricotta-y red sauce and it's like very diluted and watery and like not delicious. So instead of doing a typical red sauce and ricotta baked ziti, I am doing ziti alla zozana. Let me explain. Alla zozana is the name of an Italian pasta dish that combines the four traditional Roman pastas, cacio e pepe, carbonara, grisia, and amatriciana. Cacio e pepe is a cheese and black pepper sauce. Carbonara is egg yolks, cheese, and guanciale. And then a matriciana is a red sauce, which has guanciale, peppers, spicy peppers, and onions and garlic sometimes. And then grisia is basically cacio e pepe, but with guanciale. So take all of those sauces and throw them into one, and that's zozana. Pasta alla zozona. Pasta alla zozona. We are going to have cheese, in this case, pecorino and parmesan, black pepper, guanciale, egg yolks, all in a spicy red sauce. And I'm going to be using that as my baked ziti sauce. So to prep our ziti alla zozana, I'm going to make the spicy red sauce today. And then tomorrow I'm going to temper in the egg yolks right before adding the pasta. But I actually haven't had lunch or dinner yet, so I might make a test bowl of pasta alla zozanna and we can see how that works. Okay, cool. Let's get cooking. Our pasta alla zozanna starts by rendering some beautiful pork fat in the form of gonciale. Gonciale is pork jowl. From the cheeks, the chubby cheeks of the pork. Now, a very simple substitution if you cannot get your hands on guanciale is pancetta. Essentially, we just want cured pork that has a ton of fat because that pork fat is going to be the foundation of our sauce. So instead of using olive oil or butter, we're using pork fat, which is one of the greatest fats to ever exist. Now, we don't want big pieces of guanciale because we don't want someone biting into a big chunk of unrendered pork fat. We want this to be broken down into more manageable pieces. Guanciale! I'm gonna trim the outside. I'm gonna cut this into smaller pieces. I need to get my knives sharpened desperately. I also recommend keeping this in the fridge until right before you're about to cut it because this pork fat is much easier to slice through when it's cold out of the fridge versus when it's like warm at room temp. This is what we want with our guanciale pieces. They're nice and thin, but they're not like super tiny. They're not, we don't want like the little tiny pieces. We want just like thin, delicate match sticks of pork fat. I'm gonna chop up the rest of this guanciale and then we'll head to the stove. Oh my God, I'm like so over these fucking bangs. We're clipping them back. I almost forgot. We're going to crush our tomatoes. I'm making a double batch of this pasta sauce. So I'm using three cans of whole peeled tomatoes. It's recommended to buy whole peeled tomatoes and crush them by hand rather than buying canned crushed tomatoes because typically you want your tomatoes to be processed as little as possible. So by crushing them by hand at home, I don't know, I think it's a superstition thing. I don't really notice a ton of a difference, but yeah. I, instead of crushing with my hands, I'm going to blitz it with an immersion blender. Wow. 
wonderful. Honestly, looking at this, I don't know if I'm gonna be using all of these tomatoes. This is a lot of canned tomato. I might only use half, but we'll see. Oh, while we have the immersion blender out, I have a bone to pick with everyone who's buying up all of the crushed Calabrian chili peppers. I can only find canned... Oh my God. I'm gonna do the trick where you run the top of the lid under hot water. It's supposed to cause the metal to expand and thus loosen from the glass. All right, let's see if that worked. <laughs> Ow. Oh my God, I'm gonna sprain my wrist. This is <laughs> Woo, thank God. I removed all of the stems. Let's crush up these chilies. Now it's time to cook. We are going to be making the Zosanna pasta sauce. I'm making a double recipe, so I'm doing about half a pound of guanciale. If you're making a single recipe, use about a quarter of a pound. We're gonna have this on medium low to low heat because we don't want it to burn before all of that fat renders. It's always nice to give your guanciale or pancetta a little head start by adding a squiggle of olive oil into the cold pan. And we're just gonna let that hang out until all of that beautiful fat is rendered and it's nice and beautifully crispy and we have a delicious base for our sauce. Technically, you can use bacon instead of pancetta or guanciale. However, bacon is smoked. This is not smoked. If you use smoked bacon, you are gonna get a smoky flavor in your pasta that typically would not, you would not want. Um, it's, it's still delicious, but it's not, supposed to be, that's not supposed to be the way it is, if that makes sense. So yeah, we're gonna let this slowly render out. <sighs> BRB. I'm gonna try to do this as gracefully as possible, but I doubt it's gonna be graceful at all. Oi. See that beautiful crispy guanciale? That's what we want. Now that we've rendered our guanciale, it is time to brown off our hot Italian sausage. If you get them in links, remove the sausage from the casing. Now a trick for browning any ground meat. Instead of throwing this in as a whole block, and like crowding the pan and causing a ton of steam and zero browning, I'm going to kind of separate this into large to medium sized chunks and we're gonna brown the outside of the chunks. This prevents steaming in the pan and allows for better caramelization. And this goes for a browning ground beef, literally any ground meat. caramelized our sausage, it's fully cooked. We've broken it down into a nice fine mince. I'm now going to transfer this out of the pan. Oh my God, can I not? We have our cooked guanciale, our cooked sausage, and a mess. I'm adding some more pork fat to the pan and we're gonna start cooking out some onions. We want a very fine chop on our onion because we want it to literally just melt into the sauce. I chopped these in the food processor to get a really nice fine chop. Now the onion is going to release a lot of moisture and you're gonna use that moisture to scrub the sides of the pan to get off any of those brown bits. We're gonna let that sweat. I've decided I need to add more pork fat. Tee hee. I'm gonna throw in some garlic. Traditionally, this pasta does not have garlic in it, but I'm like, okay, be so fucking for real. We're adding garlic. Okay, and I'm shocking adding even more pork fat because I want to fry this tomato paste in the pork fat and these onions have already soaked all of it up. We're gonna do about a quarter cup to half a cup of tomato paste. I'm just gonna do the whole tube. I'm a whole tube kind of girl. 
Now for this pasta dish, we want a really rich tomatoey tomato sauce. It's gonna coat the noodles. It's gonna be super concentrated and super flavorful. But for our gnocchi, you'll see we're gonna do more of a fresh, lighter pasta sauce. Um, our tomato paste is nice and caramelized, so I'm going to add the Calabria chilies and the crushed tomatoes. Ba -ba we want it spicy. Gorge. See how it's like already? Like, can you not do that? Did you guys see that? It's like spitting up. I'd prefer if you wouldn't. It's literally messing up my whole kitchen, but like, what else do I do? Do I car cover it? I'm adding the sausage back in and I'm gonna just like toss these back in. We want these to all marry together. We're gonna let this cook. Oh my God, you can see up my nose. We're gonna bring this to a simmer, cover it and let it cook for like 30 minutes. Stirring every five minutes or so. Okay, our sauce is still reducing. Um, it's been 30 minutes. I added another 20 minutes to the timer since I doubled the recipe. I feel like it needs to reduce some more, but I wanted to show you guys the sunset. I'm boiling some water so that I can make a bowl of pasta for myself. I'm starving. Also make sure as your pasta sauce is reducing, you wanna stir it and really scrape the bottom of the pan because you don't want any sauce burning. You don't want to scorch the bottom of the pan because that happens. Here's the situation. I haven't eaten since breakfast. I'm so hungry I can barely speak to the camera without wanting to pull my hair out. So I'm gonna quickly make myself a bowl of this pasta as it's still reducing on the stove. And um, I'm gonna plate it up and I'm gonna eat it and then I'm gonna talk to you because right now I can't talk to you. I am so grumpy. Okay? Cool. My God. I have a feeling this is gonna be the best bite of pasta I've ever had in my entire life. You guys. I don't know where we go from here. This is the best pasta I've ever had in my entire life. Oh my God. Tomato based pastas are my favorite. I've traditionally said I don't have a favorite pasta, but my favorite genre of pastas are pastas in tomato sauce with a bunch of butter and a bunch of Parmesan cheese. Now, this has taken that concept to a whole new level. I like carbonara, but I find that it lacks the acidity to make it like a very balanced dish. I feel like it's very creamy, it's heavy, it's salty, but the addition of tomato really just gets, it gets me there. It, it's so balanced but it's also so flavorful. Like it's so fatty, it's so acidic, it's so spicy, it's so creamy. It's like everything you want out of a pasta, volume turned all the way up. I'm like having a religious experience. Now I've never tried this pasta before. Never seen it on a menu. I've literally never heard of it until a few months ago. And before tasting it, I thought to myself, 
the spicy sausage feels very unnecessary. I am retracting that thought. The spicy sausage and the guanciale are both equally important. The guanciale, the fat you get from rendering it, flavors this entire sauce. The sausage just gives you like little morsels and little pockets of meaty goodness. Also the spicy Italian sausage has that fennel seed in there and that fennel seed is really perfuming the entire sauce. Also, it's about six o'clock. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it's about six o'clock. I wanna take a nap, but I can't. I have other stuff to do. I have to set the table. Okay, let's compromise. I'm gonna take a break for like an hour eat this and digest. Then we're gonna set the table and do the flowers. I'm gonna do the other pasta sauce tomorrow because I realized I forgot to set aside some basil for the tomato basil sauce. So I, I can't really make it now. So I'm gonna make the tomato basil sauce tomorrow instead of tonight. This always happens. What is that saying? Shoot for the moon and even if you miss, at least you'll land amongst the stars. I shot for the moon today with our to-do list, but I should have known I was never getting through that. I'm so tired. I went to bed last night at 11.30. <sighs> That's not a good bedtime for me. Okay, I'm gonna eat this pasta. I'm gonna clean the kitchen. I'm gonna put that pasta sauce into quart containers and throw that in the fridge. And then when I'm back, we're gonna set the table and do the flowers. Okay, love you. Welcome to my dining room. Sorry about that light in the window. I can't use the overhead lighting in my apartment or else you'll get those weird lines. Welcome to my dining room. I set the table. I have this cutesy ruffle gingham pink tablecloth. Ruffle trim, adorable. And then these ruffly napkins, adorable. Um, the main reason I brought you in here today is I need to show you the flowers because a part of me thinks that this is gonna fall over while I'm asleep and I need there to be proof that this exists um so I'm showing it to you now so here's the deal this is a disco ball with a round bottom the bottom of this ball is not flat so it may fall over and it's filled with water like all the way up to here I have it flanked on all sides with vases and these ones hopefully that keeps it in place I don't know if it will though I love the tricolor peonies, the white, the pink, and the magenta. I think it's really fun and Galentine's-y. I wanted to achieve a Galentine's Day aesthetic without buying a bunch of crap, like disposable decor. I didn't want to buy new plates. I'm trying in this series to consume as little as possible and only purchase things that like I genuinely love because like who wants to see me just like buy a new table setting every week and be like, this is how you make a beautiful table setting. It's like, well, yeah, you just bought a brand new table setting. Like, of course it's gonna look good. Um, so yeah, it's a little underwhelming, but I think it, it serves its purpose. And that's the reality of my situation right now. I have these beige ass plates and these beige ass, <laughs> placemats because I just don't think that I should buy all new shit every time there's a new theme of a dinner party. I don't know. Um, so yeah, the kitchen is clean. I'm clean. Um, I have four loads of laundry that I need to fold. Um, so I'm going to do that while I watch TV. I'm going to go to bed. It's 7.45 Friday night. This is my dream Friday night. This. I'm so serious. Give me two dogs and a backyard fire pit and we've achieved like peak Friday night energy. Uh, but yeah, that's all for now. Soak this in, pray it doesn't fall over in the middle of the night and spill water everywhere. Um, and we'll see you in the morning. Sleep tight, love you.